All right, so the topic for today is uh, contraceptives and family planning. So kind of, I've been trying to get to this topic uh, as I've been preaching on children. Um, hopefully it's interesting for you guys and um, just share my, my views on, on uh, I guess, what people would know as birth control. But the reason why I don't really like referring to it as birth control, because birth control also includes things like abortion or things like morning after pills, where if you're just stopping the birth, I mean, you're just, you know, if the child is already conceived, then really you're just committing murder. You're not um, just preventing yourself from getting pregnant, which is the topic of today's sermon. So really, let's start off with the question, you know, does the Bible teach that the use of contraceptives is a sin? I personally don't think so. And we'll just go over the verses in general, what, you know, what the arguments are for people to say that using contraceptives is a, is a sin. Uh, Genesis 38.8 says here, And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. I'll just read a bit before. Um, just so we get some context here. But uh, we see here, And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, so Onan is Ur's brother, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. So we see here a story of Ur um, marrying a woman called Tamar. And for whatever reason, we're not told, Ur was a wicked person and Ur was uh, killed by the Lord. Then Judah, Ur's father, Ur and Onan's father, which is one of the, um, the, the 12 sons of Jacob, said to Onan, well, you know, fulfill the Deuteron Deuteronomy law in 25 to fulfill the duty of a husband's brother um, to, to go in unto his sister, into, unto his sister-in-law and, and raise up seed to, the, to his brothers. So, <clears throat> so basically, what happens is, you know, so Onan goes in unto his sister's brother and then spills the seed. So those of us who know what it's like just to sleep with a woman, we know what that seed is referring to. So basically, he used a method, what people would call what, coitus interruptus, which is like you um, don't sow the seed into the woman. So really, the discussion around this passage is, well, what was the sin? You know, is the sin the fact that Onan spilled the seed? Or is it the reason that Onan spilled the seed? That's really um, the, the discussion that we need to go into here. And one thing I want to say about this passage is, you know, is this passage, is it a, is it a story in the Bible? Or is it a statement? It's a story, isn't it? It's something that happened. We're not told... You know, we're told that what Onan did displeased the Lord, but we're not given the exact reason. Like, is it the fact that he spilled the seed or is it the reason that he spilled the seed, which is he did not run to raise seed for his brother? Because you've got to ask the, you got to ask the question, well, let's say if Onan had raised up seed for his brother, but then later on, you know, because that's his wife, he spilled the seed in another instance, would God still have killed him? Have you thought about that? Because people will say like, well, he spilled the seed. That's why God killed him. Well, but if the reason God killed him was because he didn't want to raise up seed to his brother, what if he did raise up seed to his brother, but then he spilled the seed another time? Would God still have killed him? And this is the issue with basing any dogmatic doctrine on a story and rather than a statement. Because we know the, a good principle is, you know, you interpret the stories with the statements in light of the New Testament. But then people will jump on this story and just say, well, here's a story where somebody practiced a method of birth control and then they run with it, now creating a commandment of men saying birth control or any type of contraceptive is a sin dogmatically. Whereas you can't really just take that from this verse because these, this story needs to be interpreted in light of other things. And I don't know whether it's um, really that clear. It's one instance where somebody spilled seed um, there could be several reasons. Well, there's a reason why he did it. So what was the reason why God was displeased with him and killed him? Some people will say, well, 
No, God didn't kill him uh, just because he didn't want to raise up seed to his brother. He killed him for spilling the seed because Onan had an, an alternative to um, not marry his sister as opposed to spilling the seed. And I'll show you what they're referring to. So the law is in Deuteronomy 25, verse 5, where we see the duty of a husband's brother. It says here, Brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child. The wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife Come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. Now, I don't understand yet all the reasons why this law is here. You know, my, in the flesh, I think, hey, you know, if my brother died and left his wife, you know, why should I be obligated to marry the woman that he chose? So I don't know all the reasons why God has it like this. You know, there must be some sort of importance of carrying on maybe the firstborn's name or your brother's name. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not sure how it works. Is maybe the, the first child, you know, is in your, in, in your brother's name and the rest of the children are in your name because then how are you raising up children to your own name? I don't know. If you guys can figure that out. But let's, let's go to um, a, a verse in Ruth. Um, Ruth 4, where we see uh, in the story of Boaz and Ruth, this law actually playing out. So then went Boaz up to the gate. So we know that in, if, you know, if you're familiar with the story of Ruth, that you know, Ruth and Naomi have, have moved um, to where Boaz lives. And Ruth is now, you know, made herself known by like picking up the, the, you know, the, the corn in, in, in Boaz's field and, and, and gathering food for herself. And Boaz notices her and, you know, they start, you know, I guess thinking about getting together, right? And then Ruth, you know, uncovers his skirt and lies next to him and does all that, that stuff that we would consider weird. But then in Ruth 4, we see here Boaz now going to his kinsman who actually has the duty of a husband's brother to Ruth and, and working out a deal where he can redeem that right to himself. So it says here in Ruth 4, Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Oh, such an one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsmen, Naomi that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, and he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the ham of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Chilion's and Marlon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Marlon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place ye are witnesses this day. So we see this sort of playing out in a sense where, you know, the kinsman, we're not given his name, is not, is not wanting to take on that duty of a husband's brother. And Boaz actually redeems that right by redeeming the land and redeeming, um, you know, uh, uh, Ruth and the right to marry her. Now, this is where, you know, I'm not 100% sure what is going on here. But then 
it says here that the kinsman said, uh, where does he say? In verse 6, And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. So I don't know whether, you know, this duty of a husband's brother, how it sort of affects your own children. So obviously he had a concern there where he didn't want to do it. Somebody else was willing on to take that duty of a husband's brother. Therefore, there wasn't that whole case in Deuteronomy 25 where the woman demanding somebody to marry her would go to the elders, you know, take off the shoe and spit in the person's face. So somebody else was willing to do that. Boaz was willing to marry Ruth and therefore Deuteronomy 25 did not fully play out. So going back to Onan, where people would say, well, the reason why Onan was killed is because he spilled seed full stop. Because if he didn't want to marry Tamar, he could have just went down the Deuteronomy 25 path. But see, the Deuteronomy 25 path is not just something where you just like Elimelech said, well, I just don't want to do it. Because if Elimelech said, well, I don't want to take on Ruth, Ruth the, um, the, the, Mo Ruth the Moabitess, and Boaz didn't want to either, well, now somebody, now Ruth could technically go to the elders and spit in Elimelech's face, basically causing shame um, if he didn't want to do that. So it's not like there are no repercussions of somebody not wanting to fulfill the duty of a husband's brother. And this is how I would interpret the story of Onan, is that he didn't want to go through that. Because remember, there was only Ur and Onan. So if Onan didn't fulfill the duty of a husband's brother, and remember Tamar, she was demanding to get married to Sheila later on and was not given Sheila to, to, to be her husband. And what did she do? She took matters into her own hand where she pretended to be a prostitute, got Judah to sleep with her, and then that's where you got Pharaohs and, and just all that trouble. So obviously she probably would have gone to the elders and, and spat in Onan's face if, she, if Onan did not marry her. So I have a feeling that Onan did not want to go through that, did not want the shame of being spat in the face. So he secretly, he, he took... Tamar to be his wife, but then secretly did not raise up children to his brother. And therefore, nobody else knew it, but God knew it, and God killed him. Um, so, did he get killed just for practicing a, a form of contraception? Or did he get killed because he wanted to avoid the shame and tried to secretly avoid it, but God knew it? Because, like I said, what if he did raise up seed? What if he didn't spill the seed, he raised up seed to his brother and another time spilled the seed? Would God still have killed him? Because was, was, was God displeased that he spilled seed or was God displeased because he was not willing to raise up seed to his brother? So if we think about that, um, that might change our opinion on what, how we would interpret the, the sin or what the sin of Onan was. Okay, let's go to another passage. Let's go to Genesis 128. Because the other angle you can take is, well, okay, you know, if somebody takes the sin of Onan in, in um, Genesis uh, 28, was it? Genesis 38, and says, okay, this is the Bible teaching that you, you cannot still see, you cannot use any type of contraceptive, um, otherwise it's a sin. Now, like I said, I think there are downsides to women taking medical or chemical contraceptives. Um, but is it a sin? Like if somebody wanted to take that on, I, I don't think it's wise because obviously if those cause abortions, then that would be wrong. Um, so let's, let's take it from another angle. Let's say somebody said, okay, that's, that's Onan, but then that's just a story. That's not really something that you can dogmatically hang your hat on and say, this is God commanding that spilling seed is a sin because he might've killed him for another reason. The other angle somebody might take is in Genesis 1.28. So let's read here in Genesis 128. It says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So the thought here is, well, children are valuable. God wants children. And here God is commanding us to have children. So anything that prevents or delays children is a sin. Now, this may seem very simple at first, but let me just uh, talk a few talk through a few things just to get you thinking on what the uh, implications of that position would mean. Now let's go to Malachi, uh, Malachi 2.14. says here, Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. 
and did not he make one, yet he had, yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. So it's no secret in the Bible that the purpose of marriage is to have children. You know, in order to, to have a children, have a family. But what we're talking about is just because the purpose of a marriage is to have children, does that mean you must have as many children as possible? Now, I believe it is a good thing to have as many children as you can. But does that mean that, it, that therefore it's a sin to delay it for any reason? Um, now, 1 Corinthians 10.31, you know, we know it says, For whatsoever you do, you know, do all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So, yes, there is this principle that we ought to do things to the best of our abilities. So if God loves children, God wants us to be fruitful and multiply, hey, yes, we ought to strive for that as much as we can. But does that mean that we totally uh, disregard any other aspect? You know, for example, the health of your family, you know, the condition of your family. Do you just dis disregard all that in order to have as many children as possible? So does this mean delaying a child for any reason is a sin? Um, here are some questions. Is it about where the seed ends up? Because if it's wrong, if, if, the, if the sin is to spill seed, then is the sin where the seed ends up? Because let's say you do an activity with your wife where the seed does not end up inside the wife. Is that sinful then? Because that means you've, you've basically lost an opportunity to create more seed, uh, to, to create children, because that was an opportunity to create children that you didn't take. Um, does the seed always need to be sown inside the wife every time? If we're striving to have as many children as we can, how often should you sleep together? Right? So does it mean it's a sin if a husband and wife are not sleeping together daily? Because, you know, then chances are you may not get pregnant and you're not having as many children as you can. Um, so what if you don't come together every day? Is, is that a form of abstinence? You know, like if, if, if a couple only uh, comes together weekly, you know, how, how is that different to somebody abstaining for a week? Um, they're, they're sleeping the same amount of times together. Uh, is it a sin for a man to work abroad? So let's say you took a job where you had to travel two months in a year. Is that sinful now? Because you're traveling when your wife is ovulating. You could be having children, but you have chosen not to. You've chosen to do something instead of have children, um, and therefore you're not fulfilling the command to be fruitful and multiply to the, to the best of your ability. So, you know, it, it's easy to say, hey, have as many children as you can, but there are other factors that, that come into play where, hey, you know, can, we, can somebody honestly, consistently take this position? What about uh, what is called lactational am amenorrhea? Lactational amenorrhea. And if you haven't heard of that, that's basically after somebody gives birth, if you practice exclusive breastfeeding, you can actually get your body to delay ovulation for up to six months and up to a year if you exclusively breastfeed. And that means you don't use bottles, you don't use dummies, um, you don't use any formula, you know, because basically stimulating the breast to produce milk can delay your ovulation. Now, it's, it, it doesn't work 100% of the time because some people try and exclusively breastfeed and their period still comes back maybe after two months, after three months. This means that they can now get pregnant physically. They can um, give birth to another child, but are they in the condition to do so? I guess, well, that would be up to them. But my question is, if somebody's against birth control, against contraceptives, yet they are striving to delay their ovulation by exclusive breastfeeding, how is that different to somebody saying, well, I don't want to have a child for another six months because I want my body to recover. Um, you know, they're delaying and then getting you know, pregnant possibly six months later, but then somebody else is saying, well, I'm going to purposely try and stop my ovulation cycle by breastfeeding because I don't want to have a child three months after I give birth. Couldn't you say, well, if you really wanted as many children as you could, why wouldn't you st like not exclusively breastfeed? Then your ov ovulation cycle would come back and you can get pregnant three months after you gave birth rather than six months or nine months or 12 months. So how is it different to somebody who tries to naturally delay their ovulation to somebody who just says, you know what? 
me and my wife, we're just going to delay the next child because I want my wife to be in the best condition she can be when she gives birth to the next child. And it's not a case of, I don't want children. It's a case of, I want as many children as I can, but I'm not just going to totally disregard the health of my family, you know, the financial situation of my family, the health of my wife, and things like that. So I need to take these things into account because I still love my family, and you know, I love my existing children, I want what's best for everyone. That's the mindset, but I still want as many children as possible. So then you've got to ask the question, so is it a matter of the heart then? You know, is it not a case of just this hard line of you must do this? It, to me, I think the use of contraceptives is a matter of the heart. It's a doubtful disputation. The question is, do you value children? Do you want as many children as God can give you, as, as many as you can provide for? Or is it a case of, hey, you know, I don't want children because I want to serve myself. I want to live life for myself. I don't want to invest money and time and resources into raising another human being because I find value in the vain things of this life. I find value in pleasure and holidays and materialistic possessions that are all going to be burnt up. So, because there are many reasons why couples may not come together on a regular basis, you know, um, and is inconvenience or working abroad, is that a better excuse than somebody just planning it and saying, you know what, let's just not try and get pregnant for the next couple of months because we have this situation that we need to deal with. Um, and then, but it's not that I don't value children, I don't want as many as I can. Um, is one excuse better than another? Is one reason better than another? Can somebody say, well, I don't want children for this reason, but if somebody says, well, I'm not going to get my wife pregnant because I need to travel for six months or I need to work abroad. Is that any different? I don't think that's really different, in my opinion, if it's the same in practicality. So who decides what is a valid excuse? You know, who decides what is a valid reason if the Bible doesn't give us any valid reasons? So this is why I think it's a doubtful disputation. It's up to the person. It's about, do you value children? Do you want as many children as you possibly can? And if there are reasons why you feel it's best for you, your wife and your family not to have children, um, then that's between you and the Lord. You know your own heart. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. This one. We'll read this passage here. It says here, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now the point I just want to bring up here, now this passage is teaching that when it comes to the physical relationship between a man and a woman, or a man and his wife, that you do not actually own your own body. If a, if a, if a woman requires something of the husband, the husband is obligated under commandment by God to give it. And likewise the woman. So any attitude where one couple, one of the couple wants to, I guess, hit the sack, the other, the other couple, the, the other partner cannot deny them. That's what the Bible is teaching here. And the reason why God teaches this and God commands this, it's, it's so that we would avoid fornication. We would avo avoid adultery. Because if you deny your husband a physical relationship, hey, there's a temptation that he's going to go find it elsewhere. And it's the same with women. If, if, if a woman, if a man does not cater to his wife's needs and desires, she's going to find that intimacy elsewhere as well. And um, this is just a fact of life. And this is why God has commanded this, um, so that you have a healthy marriage. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up in terms of uh, the topic of contraceptives and family planning is because somebody might say, and, and I think in the Catholic, Orthodox and Protestant position, they'll say, if you have a physical relationship with your wife where the goal is not procreation, you are turning your wife into a harlot. That's what they'll say. They'll say that, you know, because she's doing, she's just pleasing you. It's just, it's just about pleasure. Well, you know, this is, what, this is what the physical relationship is about. You know, the Bible doesn't teach here that, hey, let a man be married so that you, you avoid, uh, so that you can have children. It's saying here, nevertheless, to avoid fornication. And 
the whole idea of a husband and wife relationship is that they render unto each other due benevolence and they satisfy each other in those areas so they don't then go and fornicate with somebody else. So there is a purpose to marriage where it's about the pleasure aspect and not just the procreation aspect. Now, if somebody says, well, if you're not, tr if when you come together with your wife, you're not trying to procreate, then you're turning her into a harlot. I don't think that's accurate because to be honest, there's nothing really wrong with what harlots do in the sense of the acts that they perform. The problem, that, the problem with harlots is that they're doing it with people that they're not married to. That's the problem. It's not the fact that it's wrong for a husband and wife to do the same things that harlots do with their paid clients. Um, you know, the Bible says that marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. So things that are generally unclean, ge things that are generally um, people think about that harlots would do and people that fornicate would do, there's nothing wrong for a married couple to do that. Now we don't have to go into the details of what those things are, but you know, the Bible gives a green light for you know, whatever a husband and wife want to do, their bodies belong to each other, they can do whatever they like um, within the bounds of marriage. Uh, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. So there's nothing wrong necessarily with what harlots do per se, their, the acts that they do. It's that they're doing it with men who aren't their husband. Um, because is it a sin to enjoy each other without the act necessarily resulting in an opportunity to have children? Because if you take the position that, hey, God is commanding us to be fruitful and multiply, therefore have as many children as possible, Therefore, you ought to take every opportunity to have children. So anytime there is an opportunity that you don't take, you would be in sin, right? Because to him to know it, to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So is it a sin then to um, enjoy your husband or your wife without the act resulting in children? But you know, at the end of the day, you know, I admit, you know, there really isn't a method of family planning and contraception, contraception that is as enjoyable as the no planning method, obviously, because then you don't have to, you know, go to the inconvenience of those sorts of things or have abstinence or do coitus interruptus, what they call. Um, but does that mean it's a sin just because it's inconvenient? You know, um, I would say that contraceptive methods may allow a couple to not have to go to abstinence and, and in, in order to uh, plan out their family that's best for them. So, I hope that's given you some things to think about. Let's just go through a couple of reasons why I think are, I think are good reasons, um, in my opinion, because it is a doubtful disputation. So here are some of my opinions on why I think people might want to prevent or delay a pregnancy. So I've got four reasons here, and I'll just go through them and just the thoughts I have behind them. Number one is for medical reasons, medical reasons. And what do I mean by medical reasons? For example, let's say somebody has some medical procedure that they have to go through that requires x-rays, that requires um, medications, <laughs> anesthesias. And, and that's something that you've scheduled for and you've waited a long time for. Now, would it be wise for somebody to just ignore the fact that, hey, the reaping and sowing, hey, if I sleep with my wife, she will get pregnant and put that procedure in jeopardy. Or let's say you get pregnant and go through the procedure anyway, and you end up with a child that's disabled or deformed because you went through those procedures pregnant anyway. You know, you can sign the waiver, right? And just do it anyway. Is that wise? You know, or should you wait until after the medical procedure? Should you wait until after she's had all the x-rays and all the anesthetics and all those sorts of things, now, and it's detoxed out of her system, and then get pregnant to give your child the best chance to be healthy. Um, so radiation medication, scheduled med medical procedures. What if somebody has cancer and they have to undergo chemotherapy? Should they, should they get pregnant? I mean, it's up to them. I'm not saying that they, that they don't. To me, you know, if you're gonna go through a series of chemotherapy, would you do that carrying a child? And then potentially risk the child being, you know, deformed or, or, or mutated because of a decision that you made? Or would you just wait until after you've done all that and hopefully recovered from it and then get pregnant and have a child? Uh, that could be one reason. What about if, if you are, were on drugs of some sort or you took illicit drugs? You know, would you want to just get pregnant straight away or would you try and detox that out of your body, try and get your body into a, to a state where it wouldn't risk the health 
of your child. And it's, it's like the no difference between, you know, if you're pregnant or you have children. It's like if you, if you had children, you know, would you just feed them junk or just put them in an environment where they'll get sick and, and potentially, you know, just end up dying anyway? Um, so people can make that decision for themselves, you know, what is going to be the best um, situation for their family and for their child to give their child the best health. Um, so medical reasons. Two might be um, health reasons. And what do I mean by health reasons? People ask, well, is it healthy for a woman to have children consecutively one after another? Well, I think this really depends on your diet. Because when you, if you were to read online about spacing your children, I remember doing this research maybe about a year ago or so, saying, you know, because my wife, she gets pregnant, you know, every five months or so, every six months or so. And I was looking up, you know, is that actually, is that actually healthy for a woman to give birth every six or every uh, year or so, every year and a half, every two, every two years, or should children be spaced out more? The reasons I could find online were really only a couple. Um, and you can generalize some of them as socioeconomic reasons. You know, they'll say, well, if you have children so close together, they harder to raise, going to put stress on your family, um, things like that. Another one could be financial reasons. Obviously, the more children you have, the more they cost. You're going to put financial pressures on your family. Um, and they'll say that's why you want to space them out. Now, I don't necessarily agree with those because, you know, if, you know, stress is something you can handle. Um, you know, finances, you can work harder and pay for your family. So there are ways around those, but, you know, I'll get to those in a second. You know, the third one would say, like, the health of the mother. Because obviously, every time you have a baby, the baby is drawing resources from the mother. You know, every time, for those of you who know people who have been pregnant, they're always looking at their iron count. And even Elizabeth's, when we got to, like, um, Abel, her iron count was quite low. And we had to, like, pump up the iron supplements, get, you know, eat more red meat to get her iron count back up. Or was it with Sarah, I think it had dropped. I think with Sarah it had dropped, but when we went to go to Abel, her iron count had gone back up because we had started buying a lot of um, uh, grass-fed meat and eating a lot more red meat and her iron count was going back up. Now what I read with health, because they'll say space out children because of the health of the mother, because of the draining of the resources on the child, but then when you read, well how long does it take for a mother to actually recover after a birth, some of the websites will say, well, it only takes two months, three months for her to get back to how she was. So if, if you are breastfeeding your child, generally your period doesn't even come back after three months anyway. Like the earliest it'll come back is maybe three months just naturally. So you wouldn't be able to get pregnant within that three month, four month period anyway. So then I was thinking, you know, a lot of these sites, because they don't really believe in natural health, they don't really address the health of the mother. You know, they don't address, well, can a mother get back to uh, be able to give birth to another child because she is taking care of her health. She is supplementing. She's eating a really nutritious diet where she could give birth to a child one after another and remain healthy. They don't really address that topic because they assume, based on statistics, what mothers are going to be like. But if you base it on statistics, I mean, the majority of people don't take care of their health. You know, they just eat, you know, food that is devoid of nutrition. So obviously they're going to have problems with children having deficiencies in vitamin K and deficiencies in all these things. You know, that's why they give children these vitamin K shots because they think babies are just born with vitamin K deficiency. But they don't think, well, what about the mother? If the mother had vitamin K, then obviously the baby's going to be born with vitamin K. The milk's going to have vitamin K. There's another way to get vitamin K into the baby other than just injecting it with a vitamin K shot. Um, but my point is, you know, the medical industry, they don't take really this into account because it's hard to survey, you know, the, the mother and her diet and all these sort of things. It costs more money. It requires them to be, um, to be honest. And, you know, a mother's not going to want to admit, oh, you know, my child is disabled because I didn't take care of my health, you know. So all I'm saying is, you know, a lot of these things that I read online, I don't think they really take into account the fact that you can get your body back to the point where it's healthy to have pregnancies one after another, where you could technically get pregnant, you know, within a couple of months and still have the ability to give birth to a healthy child. But let's say somebody doesn't take care of their health, you know, and as they're having children, their health is just declining, you know, they, they're not taking the right steps, you know, they're, they're starting to have miscarriages because their body is just not up to keeping this child, you know, their, child, their children are being born premature, 
because their, their, their health is not just there. Should this person, and I'm just trying to get you guys to think, if it's just be fruitful and multiply and just go full speed ahead, does this person think, hey, should I wait a bit to get my body up to the point where I can even carry this child to full term? Is it my health? Is it, is it something I'm doing that's making this child be born at 28 weeks rather than at 36 weeks? Uh, is it something I can change? Is it my diet? Is, is a person smoking, right? And they're like not detoxing their body or they're taking drugs or something. And, um, you know, should they get their body to the point where they don't risk the health of the child? So besides health, you know, the other factors were like stress, relationship, finances, which I don't think are necessarily illegitimate reasons, but I think there are reasons that um, don't affect the child. You know, you, you, can, you, can, you can sort those reasons out, I think, if you have the right perspective, just in my opinion, I think they're a lot easier to deal with. So you got medical reasons, health reasons. What about financial reasons? People will say, well, I'm delaying children because, you know, I just can't afford them. Now, my opinion is in this day and age, I think that's a cop out because we, we are rich in this country. You know, there's no reason why anyone in this country can't afford children. I mean, and even if you can't afford them, you know, the system we have in government is that the taxpayers will pay for your children for you. So there's no, there's no reason really to delay children in Australia when you say I can't afford them. I mean, people have this idea that their children need to have the latest shoes, the latest clothing, the latest electronic equipment. You, know, you need to have a house where every child has their own room. I mean, this does not need to be the case. I mean, how many of us probably grew up sharing rooms, not having your own room? I mean, I slept in my mother's room up until like, I think I was in primary school because there was no room and you know, my, my parents were separated. So there's space in the queen size bed next to it. That was my bed. I never got my own bedroom when I was a kid. You know, when we got older, I ended up sh like started sharing a bed with my brothers, but then that was never really my exclusive room because you know, his part of the room was a lot bigger than mine. It wasn't until my sister moved out that I moved into her bedroom and it wasn't even for that long. But then you think about my wife's experience. I mean, my wife comes from a family of seven children and at one point they were living in a caravan. Can you believe that? A caravan. I mean, she, and she's fine. I mean, she doesn't have to have her own room. If anything, it made her more grateful for the things that she did have, you know, not growing, growing up with a silver spoon in your mouth. But, you know, we have this mentality that, you know, we have children, we need to just provide them, you know, have, you know, this whole, this idea that, you know, we have to have a house with four, you know, with uh, what, three bedrooms, because it's one for the family and one for my, my girl and one for my boy. No, no, you can have a house with three bedrooms, chuck all the boys into one room, <laughs> chuck all the girls into the other. I mean, you can have a house where you have two bedrooms and chuck all the kids in there. You know, if, and if girls need to get changed and have privacy, they can go into the bathroom. They can go, you know, you can make it work. But my point is, to raise a family doesn't cost as much as you think it does. And especially in Australia, I don't think really that's a legitimate excuse. But I'm not going to say that financial reasons are not a legitimate excuse at all. Because let's say, for example, you live in a third world country and, and, and there's famines. And, you know, you're struggling to keep your, your existing family alive. You've had children die of starvation. You kind of think, well, in that situation, if I'm going to take a hard and fast rule that it is a sin for them to not have children, I mean, is it wise for them to have a child when they cannot even feed the ones that they have? That their family is starting to die because it's just hard enough to get food as it is? Would they do that? So you've got to think about things like that. Um, on that topic, I just want to show you this verse. I'll just change gears for a second and just show you a thought that I had. You know, I've often seen this passage used to say, hey, you know, if you, if you just go full steam ahead with children, hey, God's going to provide for you. Because, you know, I've not seen the, I've been young and now I'm old. Yeah, I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Now, if that was the case, you know, why would we have passages, for example, I don't know if I actually put them in my, in my, in my notes, but in Thessalonians where the Bible says, uh, is it in Thessalonians? I can't remember exactly what book it's in. But it says, you know, if any provide not for his own, especially if those for his own house, he is denied the faith and is worse for an infidel. Yeah, so is, that, is, this, is this a passage that we can apply saying, well, God will always provide for you no matter how many children you have. Whereas in the New Testament it says, hey, you, you better... Get the, take the responsibility and provide for your children. And if you don't, meaning it's possible for you not to provide for your family, then you're worse than an infidel. 
Um, I don't think Matthew 6, can, you can really say, well, you know, you seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Because what if somebody's not seeking the kingdom of God? Can they still claim that promise? But anyways, what, what I found interesting about this is, is my point is, you know, there is a responsibility on the part of the parents to provide for their family. And somebody can't just take this verse and just say, well, it doesn't, I'm just going to totally disregard my responsibility. God's always going to provide for me because he said here, well, I'm, I'm never going to be begging for bread. But you know what's interesting about this verse? And I was telling Ashton last week, if we go to Luke 16, you guys know this passage is um, pretty famous when we talk about, yeah. Now, if that Old Testament passage in Psalms is saying, nobody saved will ever have to beg for food, how do you explain Luke 16 and Lazarus? Right? It says here, uh, uh, verse 21, uh, verse 20. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Now remember it says, I've, never, I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread, but then he's called a beggar. <laughs> he's like, Lazarus is a beggar. And look at this, beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at, his, laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. So what is he begging for? He's begging for bread, Right? But the psalm verse is saying, I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And here is Lazarus, who is saved, because remember, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. But here he is, a beggar, and he's begging for bread. So is that passage applicable, I think, under the new covenant? And this is why I think the way we rightly interpret some of these Old Testament passages, because remember, it says here, I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. New Testament says there is none righteous, no, not one. So what is this verse? How do we really apply this verse? Is it talking about a physical begging of bread, a physical need? Or is, it, is there a spiritual application to this Old Testament passage? I would say one way, you know, well, we see already in the New Testament that Lazarus was saved and he was begging for bread. So to me, that shows me, well, I can't interpret this physically, so what's the spiritual meaning? It could be, well, if we're saved, because we're righteous by faith, God said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we'll never be forsaken by Jesus. Um, and, his, and his seed will never be begging bread. That could be talking about the word of God. Man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So I wonder if the application is, hey, those that are saved, will never be forsaken and we will always have the word of God. You know, we'll never be, where is the word of God? You know, do, we don't have to climb, you know, like the lower of says, you know, where should we go to go get the word of God? No, it's in your heart and it's in your mouth. Um, and we'll never be begging for the bread that we need to live spiritually. So just the thought there, um, you know, I think this is like, you've got the Old Testament blessing and then you've got the New Testament salvation in Christ, word of God application. Um, when it comes to Old Testament passages. So we just have to be careful when I think we run with creating a doctrine based on a story like we saw in Onan or creating a doctrine based on an Old Testament passage disregarding what we ha has been revealed to us in the New Testament. Um, so medical reasons, health reasons, financial reasons. Um, and you know what? I admit, like people might use these as an excuse and this is why I think it's a matter of the heart. You know, if somebody says, if somebody really doesn't want children just because they're selfish or self-centered and they're like, oh, I'm just struggling financially and they use it as an excuse. I mean, I'm not going to then say the excuse, that, well, that reason is not a legitimate reason, but it's, it's an issue of their heart. You know, if, they, if they're too selfish and too self-centered to want to have children, to see the value in children, that's the problem, um, not the excuse that they're trying to use for that. It's the same with soul winning, right? Like people have reasons for why they can't go soul winning. They might have obligations they have to fulfill where they can't go every week. They can't go every month, but they go as often as they can. You know, I'm not going to say that those are illeg illegitimate reasons, that there's no legitimate reason to ever skip soul winning, but it's about your heart. You know, if you don't actually want to go soul winning, if you don't see the need to go soul winning, if you don't see the fact that God wants us to go soul winning, that's the problem. You know, I'm not going to say that therefore somebody who has that heart to want to go soul winning can't have legitimate reasons why not to. Same with church tendons, same with, with other things where we're not told how many or how often to do it, just to do it to the best of our ability with what God has given us. 
so medical, health, financial. Um, the last one I had was uh, danger or persecution. And I guess they're all sort of interlinked, but you know, somebody might be in a situation where they need to flee a country. And you know, obviously I have to sort of think of hypotheticals just to sort of like put these into play. But let's say, for example, you know, during the tribulation, you know you're only going to go three and a half years and there's heavy persecution. Is that a time to get your wife pregnant and have children? I don't know, maybe. You know, I guess if you, you can decide for yourself. But let's say you're on the run. You know, are you going to risk like, okay, now like, the pregnant woman is going to slow everyone down. What happens when she gives birth? You know, and then you've got the recovery. I mean, if you're on the run, is it a time to think about you know, you know, in investments and, and setting up a family and things like that? Or are you just trying to survive? Are you just trying to run and get to the next place? Or let's say you're in a country that you're going to flee and you've been planning this for ages, right? I'm just, I'm just thinking of examples. <laughs> Tell me if they're stupid or not. But let's say you're planning to flee this country, right? And, 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 and you know, you've been planning this for like 10 months, years, that this is the plan we're going to meet here and, and get over and we're going to travel you know, the perilous seas to get to Australia. So let's say, let's say that that plan is like in a year's time. Would you have a child now? Or would you wait until you flee and then have a child in the place where you have peace and, and risk you know, the, the, the unsanitary conditions or you know, the lack of food, all that sort of thing where you, you may have to starve yourself to make that trip you know, is that the best condition to raise a child in your womb? Um, so there might be reasons like that, dangers or persecution. Now here's a thought. So, so, and I sort of addressed this in the last sermon. And I know like this to me, it's sort of deep, so I'm just trying to collect my thoughts as I sort of share this with you. But people will say, they have this mentality, and I sort of addressed this last sermon where people say, well, I'm just going to leave it up to God. And if I get pregnant then that means God wanted me to have a baby. And if I don't get pregnant, then God didn't want me to have a baby. See, to me, that's not right because it's not even true because we know that the more we sleep with a, a woman, the more likely she's going to get pregnant. If we don't sleep with her, she's not going to get pregnant. So there's an element where we can control that situation. Yes, God can open and close the womb. If God does not want you to have a baby, he won't give you a baby. But then why then do wicked people have babies? You know, wicked people, like, you know, people who do IVF, they are able to conceive children and have children. So if we have this frame of mind, well, if it's a bad situation, if it's not the best situation, then God won't give me a child. Well, why is then God allowing children to be adopted to same-sex parents? These are homosexuals. So we, we can't have this idea that, well, God won't allow it. I think the deep opposition is the womb is open. You know, the womb is always open. It's just whether God has closed it or not. Just like a garden will normally bear fruit. But if God didn't want that garden to bear fruit, it doesn't matter how much you take care of it, you're not going to get fruit. But as a, as, a, as a default, it will bring forth fruit. So I don't think this mentality of, well, if it's a bad situation, God won't allow a child to be conceived because there are bad situations where God does allow a child to be conceived. So God may not necessarily stop you from conceiving a child, even though you're not making the best choice for the health of that baby or the, for your situation. So I don't think this whole idea of like, well, I'm just going to trust the Lord um, is an excuse for irresponsibility, uh, as an excuse to not take care of your children, especially when it comes to um, things that can adversely affect the rest of their life. You know, if they're disabled because of a decision you made. <clears throat> we ought to try and um, keep our children in the best health that we can. So those, I think, are some, in my opinion, some legitimate reasons. I think some bad reasons would be, I've got a list here. I mean, no regard for the will of God and the value of children. So if somebody obviously is practicing uh, using contraceptives because they don't care about the value of children, they don't care about raising godly seed for God, then that would be a wrong reason. Obviously, if you want to fornicate, right? If you're trying to not have children because you're sleeping with people that you shouldn't be sleeping with. Uh, laziness. You know, you can't be bothered having a family. You can't be bothered raising children and doing that work for God. That would be a, a wrong reason too. In my opinion. <clears throat> you know, just sin in general. Self-centeredness, selfishness. Maybe a fear. People might like be fearful of the unknown. You know, they date somebody for years and years and years just because they're 
scared of marriage rather than just taking that step of faith. It's the same with children. You're never going to be 100% ready for children. Um, and I think it's better that you do it sooner rather than later for a, a lot of reasons. So in conclusion, I think the use of contraceptives is a doubtful disputation. I think there are reasons why somebody might want to delay it. But somebody might ask the question, but Victor, why do you have so many kids if you think it's okay to use contraceptives? Because just because I think it's okay to use contraceptives doesn't mean I necessarily want to use them. Because I don't necessarily want to unnecessarily limit the amount of children I have because I value children. So people will see my family and they think, well, I think contraceptives are a sin. Well, I don't think they're a sin, but that doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to limit the number of children I can have. I still want to have as many children as possible. So Psalm 1 and 27, I'll show you this verse here. Because I think this is a good principle. It says, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So I want to be a happy man. I, I believe God says, hey, well, if you have your quiver full of children, you are going to be a happy person. It's a blessing. It's not a curse. So the attitude we ought to have is children are valuable. You know, and I want as many children as possible. Um, how many children do I want? Well, I want as many children as I can have. People always ask me at work, oh, you know, you're up to your fourth. Is the fifth along the way? You know, do you have a limit on how many children you have? And I say, like, no, I don't have a limit. I want as many children as I can possibly have, not disregarding, obviously, the health and well-being of my family. Because I explain to them, you know, well, what else in life is really more valuable to invest your time and money into? You know, besides, you know, besides, I guess, the, the spiritual things, you know, when it comes to soul winning and things like that. But then this is part of that job. You know, part of the reason why you want to raise godly seed is so that your soul winning and Christian ministry of your life can be more effective. And, and you know, when I explain this to people, nobody has ever really disputed that. I, I, I mean, I, maybe I haven't met some, you know, rabid left-wing, you know, pro-abortion person yet where they just think, you know, that gorilla is <laughs> more valuable than a child. But um, everyone that I've explained that to where I say, you know, I don't have a limit and I say to them, you know, because I don't think there's anything more valuable to invest my time and resources in. They, they, they agree. How can you disagree with that? How can, how can they think that they're not more valuable than the pleasures in life? Because obviously they have some respect for life and value because they respect themselves, you know, and, and somebody had to raise them for them to even have that life. So people don't dispute that. Um, you know, and I like to sort of give this analogy just to get people thinking how valuable a child's life is and to encourage them to have more children. Uh, I often tell people, you know, if you had a child and for whatever reason that child's life was threatened, let's say they had a, a, a life-threatening illness, I mean, you would do whatever it took to save the life of that child. You wouldn't even give it a second thought. If you had to take a second job, if you had to give up some pleasures, if life had to get hard, you would do whatever it took to save the life of that child because you see the value in that child. You see that that child is worth the extra work, the stress, whatever. So why don't you see that about a child you don't have yet? You know, you, when you have a child, you value the life where you'll do whatever it takes to keep the life of that child. So why don't people have that attitude in order to gain another child? Do you know what I mean? Like if I, like if I would do whatever it took to keep my four children because I realize how valuable they are, why would I not do whatever it took to have a fifth one? Like why would I say, well, I don't want the fifth one because it's not valuable enough to make the changes in my life to be able to cater for that fifth child. So I think it's a good uh, sort of perspective to have to encourage people, hey, have more children, they're valuable. You already realize the value of children. Um, why don't you value the children you are yet to have? And I'll just end on this, um, this point. I'll just, I wonder if I got the right verse actually. Ah, okay, good. Because I just wanted to compare these two scriptures in the Bible just on um, the sea monsters versus the ostrich. Um, because, you know, sometimes, sometimes we see a problem, right? But we promote the wrong solution. And what I mean by that is, you know, we might see a problem with, like, uh, let me give you an, ex an, analogy, uh, an example. Like, we might say, oh, you know, look at all these Christians, they're not living for God. So that's the problem, right? But then in our zeal to want these people to do right, we come up with the wrong solution. And they'll say, 
well, it's because you're probably not saved. That's why you're not living right. You know, <laughs> they start to say, well, you know, they don't have the works. They don't have the fruit. You can't see the new man. And we start, some churches obviously that preach the wrong gospel, their solution is to then have people look to their works for their salvation in order to encourage people to do the right thing. Because they'll say, well, if you just tell people that they're saved and they can do whatever they want, then they're not going to want to go to church, right? But then that's the wrong way to encourage people to go to church or to encourage people to get involved in church because it's false, because you don't judge your salvation by your works. So how, how do we get people to want to serve God? Well, we need to point them to God. They need to behold the Savior. They need to realize that they need to be grateful for what God has done for them. You know, do you want to love the Lord? If you love me, keep my commandments. Not if you're worried about your salvation, keep my commandments. So sometimes we see a problem, but we promote the wrong solution. And sometimes I, I think it's the same, similar to this, where we see a problem where Christians don't value children, they don't want children, they want to stay in the home. So sometimes we'll come up with a man-made reason and say, well, hey, you, it's a sin not to sleep with your husband, it, you know, which, which it is if he wants it. Or you know, they'll say it's a sin to practice contraceptives to get them to have more children. Whereas why can't the solution be a different tact? You know, rather than creating a man-made um, commandment, which I don't think the Bible is really clear on, why don't we get people to change their perspective? You know, it's like with Solony. If you change your perspective and say, hey, look on the things of eternity. You know, what, why, what are you using your life doing? Why are you spending your life on vain things rather than spending your life, you know, getting people saved and getting people um, living for God? It's the same with children. Why don't we spend our time or think about how valuable they are, what they can do for the kingdom of God, the positive benefits to encourage people to want to have them. Because I believe if we do it the wrong way, what we do is we create resentment in people. And it's the same in a church. If you just do things right because you're forced to do them, what's the sort of attitude you'll have when you do them? Oh, I'll just come to church because I have to be here because I'm a member. And if, I'm, and if I don't come to church, I'm going to lose my membership and I'm not going to be able to vote at the next meeting. Or something like that. You know, like, you know, I'm just coming because people are going to bug me and like, you know, I'm just going because I have to. You know, it builds resentment because you, you're not building a love to do the right thing. And it's the same in, in any aspect of life. And it's the same with children. If we encourage people to have children the wrong way, sometimes it'll just build resentment where people are just having children and they resent, the, they resent it. They resent the church for forcing them. They resent their husband for forcing them. They resent their children because they're forced to look after them when their heart has not changed. They haven't realized the value of children where they have children and now they'll love them and want to do that in the right uh, attitude. And I wanted to just compare this. So in Lamentations 4.3, we see here, even the sea monsters draw out the breast. And it's funny that God uses sea monsters as a picture of a nurturing mother. You know, whether a mother is willing to take the time and breastfeed her child rather than just give, her to, give the child to a nanny and bottle feed the child, right? <laughs> so saying here, the sea monsters, you know, the monsters in the sea, which are probably the most dreadful mon you know, animals there are, if you didn't know, I believe Leviathan in the Bible, he talks about this fire-breathing animal, actually lived in the sea. So, you know, we're talking about even Leviathan maybe, like a female Leviathan is willing to draw out the breasts and give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. So we see here the contrast between the sea monsters who love their children, willing to draw out the breasts for the children and nurture the children. The opposite is the ostrich. And if we want to see what the ostrich is like, we'll go to Job 39. Job 39, verse 13. Oh, go upstairs and you don't talk to mommy. Okay. <coughs> uh, here, the ostrich. Verse 13. Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto, unto the ostrich, <coughs> which leaveth her eggs in the, in the earth, and warmeth them in dust? You know, when I read that verse, I think of, um, you know, just women just dropping their kids off at a daycare, like not, not wanting to draw out the breast and take care of their own children. You know, they'd rather work and go pursue something else and somebody else raise their children, you know, leave them in the dust, um, leave her eggs in the earth. You know, the other thought I get when it says here, she leaveth her eggs in the earth and warmeth them in dust. I think of surrogacy. It's like you're not even raising your own child, you know, you're carrying your own child, like putting them somewhere else and then the child is raised and then you take the child 
Um, <laughs> which leaveth her eggs in the dust and warmeth in the earth and warmeth them in dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them or that the wild beast may break them. You know, it's almost like you know people that leave their children to be taken care of by somebody else, and they don't even think about what people can do to their children. You know, the, the molestation that goes on, even the other children. You know, a lot of the sexual abuse cases are other children abusing younger children. I don't know if you know that. Like, you know, maybe teenage boys abusing younger girls or likewise um, the other way. And forget it that the foot may crush them or that the wild beast may break them. Look at this. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear because God hath deprived her of wisdom. Neither hath he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifted up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider. You know the thought I get when I read that verse, when she lifted herself up on high, she scorneth the horse and her rider. It's like when she looks up to do something else, she hates the fact that there's a man on a horse going to war or something. And the thought I get is, you know, women that don't value children, don't care about children, they envy what men do. You know, they want to go to the workforce and they, they hate that. They hate the fact that men get to go work, they're not burdened by children. But my point is, see, if people don't value children, you see how they just have the attitude of an ostrich as opposed to the attitude of a sea monster. So this is where the change has to take place. It's not just in the outward, it's on the inward. If you value children, then you'll raise them with the right attitude. Whereas if somebody's just going through the motions, just raising children, they might just end up like an ostrich where they don't really care about the children they're raising. They're just doing it because they have to. Um, and I think that makes a big difference. All right, so I'll, I'll end it there. Hopefully that gave you guys some things to think about. I know it's, it's not a, uh, a simple topic, um, but I hope I was clear in just communicating what I believe the Bible teaches and how we can apply that. And ultimately, I think it's a doubtful disputation, so it's an issue of the heart. If we value children, we'll want children, and it won't, it'll become a non-issue. All right, thanks. Uh, let's, um, let's pray. All right, Lord, thank you for um, this time, and I just pray, Lord, that you bless the rest of our fellowship together. Um, thank you for the rain that, uh, that waters the earth. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you'll keep us dry and uh, help us not to get sick as we go out and preach the gospel later on and tell people about the good news. And I pray, Lord, that um, you just give us wisdom as we live our lives. Help us, Lord, to have an inward change rather than just the outward change, that the inward change may lead to outward change. Uh, Lord, help us to, to love one another. Help us to just understand uh, your word and help us to apply it correctly. And uh, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>